Rose Garden Center. Uh, today we're going to be talking about houseplants. Um, for those of you that are watching online, it's actually kind of sleeting, snowing outside. It is January, so this is that time of year when, okay, winter is starting to drag on, um, everything's been dormant outside, um, things are looking kind of bare. We, we would like to see some life, some green, um, and so the way to do that is to bring it into the house. And so we're going to be talking about uh, the, the plants that you can enjoy indoors and, and really, um, really spruce things up that way until you can go outside and do a little more. Um, you can't see it right now from the camera, but we've got kind of a jungle over there in our house plant room. I brought just a few samples over here uh, to talk about and then after the class we'll, uh, we'll go over there and you can ask questions and uh, we'll talk about the different plants that you, you would like to know more about. So the first thing you want to do is decide where you're going to be putting the plant uh, or consider uh, where you would like to put it if you can. Uh, what is the lighting like? And also what are your specific needs? I know a lot of you uh, travel. I have people come in all the time saying, hey, you know, sometimes I have to go on a business trip or I go to see my kids. I'm gone for weeks at a time. So that's another thing you want to take into consideration. How much care does this plant need? Uh, in cases like that. So let's uh, go with uh, lighting first. Uh, the, uh, different levels of light in your home, uh, inside your home, the light is always going to be um, much dimmer than it would be um, outside. So you always need to consider, is that spot going to have enough light? What we consider a dim light area, uh, it, you can still read newspaper print by it. That's the part that always uh, confuses everyone how dim is too dim. <laughs> you should be able to still read a newspaper by the light. Uh, as for what plants you can use at that point, you have choices yet. So for example, this right here is a ZZ plant. Um, it's Zamiofolus, Zamiococcus, something like that. Oh, um, Zamiococcus Zamifolia. <laughs> I had it backwards. So we call it ZZ plant. You can ask anyone who knows house plants. If you say ZZ plant, they'll know what you're talking about. Uh, takes low light well. Uh, I find that the more light it gets, the more perky it looks, uh, but it still actually tolerates a, a low light level better than most plants. This is really, really good for those areas that uh, a lot of things just aren't making it. So this one's a really, really excellent one. And this one will get eventually and again, depending on its light levels, around two, I have seen in some cases three feet. Usually it's around two though. So uh, this one's a, an eight inch pot. They're kind of slow growing. So if you want a good sized plant, I would say get, get one that already looks good. Don't get a tiny one and then wait for it to grow, especially since you're probably going to be putting it in that low light area. When you put tropicals into low light. Um, this actually has to do with where they hail from. Uh, they, they go through periods where they're in the dark and then periods where they're in the light due to what the canopy above them is doing. <laughs> and so they have the ability to change their metabolism to adjust. So in dark, um, they're able to live and survive, but they do slow down their metabolism so they don't grow so much. So uh, that's how they're able to survive in those lo low light conditions by doing that. So uh, if you're going uh, with a dim light plant, you want to start off with a larger plant. Don't wait for it to grow. Another one uh, is this one right here. This is called Sansevieria, uh, usually referred to as mothers-in-law tongue. <laughs> this one has been getting some attention lately. Uh, NASA did a study. Uh, on air plants, on uh, plants that can purify the air, that can actually pull in uh, pollutants. And this one was one of the ones that ranked the highest. And this one is particularly good at chemicals. There's all sorts of different pollutants. There's allergens, chemicals. Of course, your house is always full of chemicals because you're using cleaners and cosmetics and fragrances and things that you don't even think about usually. There's all kinds of things in your home. This one was ranking really high 
for pulling chemicals. So this one was really good for formaldehyde and a lot of other things that I don't know how to pronounce. This one was really good. And then this one is also very excellent for uh, dim light situations. So if you have one of those spots, hardly anything else will survive there. This one will do it. This is the mother-in-law tongue or just tongue plant. Snake plant is another one that it's sometimes called. This one will, will take care of it. And another great thing you can see, the way it grows, straight up. That's another nice thing about it. So if you have limited space, this is a favorite. This is a must have. All right. Yes. How much water do you need to let it dry out? Or do you always keep moist? How much water? Thank you. And I was actually about to get to that. ZZ plant and Sansevieria, both excellent. For those of you that travel or just forget to water, this one is great for people who are busy because they only need water oh, every three, four weeks, sometimes even less. So it would be bad to give it too much water. Yes, you, it would be bad to give it too much water. In fact, that's the fastest way to kill these things. <laughs> so um, when you water, water thoroughly. Uh, go ahead and make sure that you give it enough water so that all of the, the soil is soaked through so that all of the roots are able to take up water. If you try to just drizzle it on, what's going to happen is that the you'll have patches that get wet and patches that stay dry. A lot of the water will escape. Uh, because this is a plant that likes to be in dry soil, you know you're going to really let that soil dry out. So the, the soil will actually shrink back a little bit from the pot. So there's spaces where the water can escape and not really soak into the soil. So make sure to water thoroughly when you, when you water a plant, uh, especially ones that like to go dry, you actually have to make sure you give them a good deep soaking. But then don't do it again until it is completely dry out. Uh, in, in, at the most, you're looking at three, four weeks with ZZ plant and tongue plant. Um, I've actually seen cases where the soil just didn't dry out that fast, and it went, you know, a month or two. Yes? Do you ever recommend soak, soaking them completely for a while, say an hour or so, and then pull them out? You can do that. If, if that's what it takes to get the water completely in there, yes. The question was, um, is it okay to soak them in water? Um, soak them as long as it takes to get the water throughout. In fact, what I often do, it, we are in an arid climate. This kind of changes the way we do things. In a more humid climate, soil may seem dry, but it doesn't really dry out in the same way as it does in an arid climate. Um, it, it receives water better in a humid climate. So uh, if you've ever taken a, a sponge that's really dried out or a washcloth that's just completely bone dry and tried to put it under running water, it takes uh, several seconds for it to start absorbing water. Have you noticed? It's, it's not going to absorb that water very quickly. And so you have to really soak it or work that water in, kind of rub it or something. It's the same way with the soil. You actually have to uh, give it some time to absorb the water. So when you water, um, you should have a good saucer under it. Let it sit in the saucer of water. Don't empty that saucer right away. Actually let it sit because a lot of the water just ran right through into the saucer, did not actually soak into the soil. Let it sit in that saucer of water and wick that water back up into the soil. So by all means, yes, soak that soil because it's, it's not going to want to do it right away. So don't just water it and then walk away. Do you change watering techniques when there is a change in season? We go from basically a warm, uh, moist area inside homes to sometimes a very cold, dry mm -hmm. environment. What do you do there? Um, sometimes when you change a plant, or if the seasons plant, uh, change, or if you change a plant from one location to another, yeah, that's going to change how much water it needs, or how, rather how often it needs. You always want to continue with that soaking, but um, you may find that during certain seasons you have to water less often. Um, one, because the soil isn't drying out as fast, so maybe it just doesn't want to be watered as much or wants to be watered more. Um, also, the, the needs of the plant will actually change. Um, their metabolism does go up and down throughout the year, especially from winter to summer. 
um, their metabolism is going up and down. And just like us, they can have growth spurts and, and you know, just like kids do, you know, they, they can have these spurts or sometimes we'll have a, a time when for some reason we're hungrier than usual. You ever have, you know, one of those days or weeks, it just seems like you're wanting to snack a lot. Or you'll have times when you oh, I just haven't been very hungry lately. They actually do the same thing. So they can kind of go up and down, maybe not quite as erratically as us, but <laughs> they will have times where the needs kind of change. With, and it usually it changes with the season. So if you're in your rainy season, that could change things. If you're in the winter season, they might slow down and say, oh, I don't need so much. And things like that, definitely. And of course, as the room changes, the room temperature, um, aridity, you know, we have a rainy season where it's not so arid and then we have drier seasons or even in summer, we tend to be running an air conditioner, dries out the air, really dries out the air. That can make the soil dry out faster. So some, most of the time they're pretty consistent. It's not such, we're not talking about such wild things that it is going to kill the plant. But yeah, you'll notice that at some points it needs more or less. For the most part, they're pretty consistent, but you'll, you'll see those little changes. And did you have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yes? The water in the saucer, mm -hmm. is there some point where you should really just dump that water? Yeah, I would say after you know, probably an hour or so, okay. you can go ahead and dump the water out of the saucer. Because it's not healthy. Right, it's that not at all healthy for them to sit in water too long. <laughs> that goes for any plant, whether it likes water or not. There's a point where it's too much. They don't want to sit in water. Um, that brings us to the next point, uh, potting. Uh, we, if you've done most of your gardening outdoors, you know that bigger pots tend to do better. Uh, plants, uh, the bigger pot, they, they don't dry out as fast. When you're outside, that's a good thing because they're out in the sun and the wind and things are really drying out and, and little pots constantly need water and the plants tend to stress more. When you come inside, it changes that. So inside, the soil doesn't dry out fast enough sometimes if it's in a, in a really big pot. And uh, the plants can sometimes suffer from that. They, they, they just, you'll see the symptoms of overwatering or just sitting wet too long. Maybe, not, maybe the soil is not necessarily um, soggy, but it's, it's just too wet or a too long a period of time than the plant really wants if it's in a really big pot. So you always want to keep your pots rather on the tight side. And so you'll notice um, that the, the plants that are often, uh, like this one is as big as it would want to go. This is an eight inch pot. We have a Chinese evergreen here. These are really great for medium light um, or in some cases even dim light. Um, I, I've seen them do very well. Uh, this is an 8 inch pot. This is as big as this plant wants to be in for right now. If this pot were any bigger, it would actually be in danger of staying too wet too long. So always keep house plants in kind of a tight shoe. Uh, this one will probably be happy in here for you know, a couple years, or probably quite a few years actually, mm -hmm. in this one pot. Uh, it wouldn't need to go bigger. When you finally do go up in size, uh, two inches, four at the most. No more than that. Uh, this one I'd probably go more like you know two inches. Maybe if it was a really big plant and I didn't want to plant it for a good long time, I would do four inches. Especially things like a, a ficus or um, a palm, things that are fast growing. Okay, I need to give it more growth room. I can go up to four inches. Uh, but you want to keep the pot rather on the tight side. And they like it. They actually like being almost root bound. There does come a point where it's too tight when they've finally been in there long enough that they start getting really root bound. Usually the first sign of this will be that uh, you'll notice it needs water more often because at this point the soil is just depleted and it's nothing but roots down there. And so there's no soil to retain moisture around the roots. And so you'll notice, gee, this thing is thirsty all the time it's probably root bound, it's time for it to go up to the next size pot. So then you, then you know. And you'll also see other symptoms too. Um, you can look at the drainage holes, you can see there's a lot of roots in there, they're kind of packed, they're spiraling, they're sticking out of the holes. Those are other signs that okay, it would be safe to go ahead and up pot 
the plant. But otherwise, be very careful about overdoing that, especially with plants that like to be on the dry side. Uh, we've got, I think I'll go over a, a few things uh, since we're talking about water. Let's talk a little bit about humidity. Some of these plants do prefer more humid climates. Yes. Back to pots. Is, sure. it, is a clay pot better than a plastic pot? Great question. Is a clay pot better than a plastic pot? You know what? The clay pots, they do allow the soil to dry out a little bit faster, and they do uh, allow more airflow through the soil. So yeah, that, that absolutely is true. And especially if you're in a case where maybe you're one of those that's a little prone to watering heavily or maybe you tend to have a more humid environment maybe because of you know humid fires or swamp coolers or whatever sometimes that might work out better for you some people find that uh, uh, they are prone to overwatering in a plastic pot on the other hand those of us that tend to on the dry side we find that we forget to water that terracotta pot a little more often so it, a lot of it mostly i think just has to do with the person in our climate you can kind of do either really and then uh, humidity is another thing. Again, uh, each home can be a little bit different. Some people use a swamp cooler, others use an air conditioner. Swamp cooler adds moisture to the air. Air conditioner takes the moisture out. And we're already in arid climate, and a lot of us have uh, air conditioners. So uh, humidity does affect plants in a big way. Some of them are pretty uh, versatile. They're able to take different uh, types of climates. They're able to you know, adapt. Um, it can be kind of difficult if they go suddenly from one to the other. If they've lived in, in a humid climate all their lives, you'll see this with plants that have lived all their lives in a greenhouse. You bring them into your home and it looks like it's dying. If you've ever tried an elephant ear, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Or even sometimes uh, those little uh, miniature roses that you get from the grocery store and you'll see the same thing. All of a sudden all the leaves start dying. Don't panic. I've actually seen cases where the leaves fell off and the new ones grew back and the new ones were adapted to the new climate because they had developed in that new climate. So don't throw it away just yet if you've got an elephant's ear. I've learned that with elephant's ear. That's the one with those great big leaves, huge tropical humidity loving leaves. Um, the, the new ones do grow out and survive longer than the, the old ones. So if you ever get an elephant's ear, you know, don't panic. <laughs> uh, some plants uh, just will always kind of prefer a little bit more humidity. Ferns tend to be among that group. Some ferns, however, do a little bit better. Again, arid climate. So for most of us, we're kind of needing to look at plants that can tolerate low humidity. So unless you're going to be keeping this in the family bathroom or something, you need to think about that. This particular fern, this is a Boston fern, and we have found that these seem to do a lot better than other ferns. A lot of ferns, they just go into this long, slow death as soon as they come out of the greenhouse that they were originally grown in. Uh, these do so much better. So if you like ferns, I really recommend the Boston because they seem to do so much better than all of the others. Uh, so we do, we do have quite a few of these. We generally almost always have these in stock because they are rather popular. People who like ferns know to go to this one. Uh, as for getting more humidity to a plant, uh, putting them in the bathroom, especially if you have a family because more people are using the shower and the sink, that's always humidifying. Um, putting them in the bathroom, putting them by the kitchen sink or just somewhere in the kitchen uh, can help. Pebble trays are great. Uh, that means you take a saucer. Did I bring a saucer up here? Mm, I don't think I did. But take a saucer. And uh, maybe one that's a little on the wide side, too, if possible. This one's an 8-inch pot, so I'd probably get a saucer that was a you know, good 10 inches at least. Take that, uh, that saucer, fill it with pebbles, and set the plant, the pot, on top of the pebbles. Fill the saucer with water. Uh, the pebbles will hold the plant up out of the water so that's not getting soggy and getting root rot. Uh, and then as that moisture evaporates, it's the, the evaporation of the moisture is coming up into the leaves of the plant and humidifying it. And the leaves are kind of catching that moisture as it rises up. So 
a common thing that people will do in other climates is misting. I'm not a big advocate of that, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. It's something you can try, especially if you have a lot of plants. It seems to work a little bit better in a case like that. The problem with misting is that you go and you mist the plant and then all of a sudden the mist just dissipates and it's gone before it could actually do anything beneficial for the plant. It needs to actually hover around the plant for some time before it can actually do any good. So misting, unless you're homebound and you're constantly you know, able to mist throughout the day, it's not something that's really that beneficial. If you can only do it once a day, that's not really going to do a whole lot for the plant. It's just more work for you, to be perfectly honest. Um, I would say get a plant that uh, can go without humidity or use pebble trays and other tricks. Even a humidifier will work. Uh, just the misting. If you have a lot of plants, plants have, if you have, if you have a lot of house plants, they do have a tendency to kind of help hold humidity in the air and keep it circulating and keep it in the area. In a case like that, misting is a little more beneficial. So it, you can do a lot more. And actually just having a lot of plants all together, they humidify each other. So if you've got a lot of plants in the room, that alone will, will allow the plants to benefit each other as far as humidity goes. Um, I want to bring up ficus, because I know a lot of you have tried ficus and you always wonder, why did it die on me? <laughs> this is variegated ficus. What's interesting about this type, this is ficus benjamina, again, this is the variegated ver uh, variety. Ficus benjamina has this odd little thing that it does, and it tends to cause owners to panic. When it's moved from one climate to another, it drops all its leaves. Yeah, I can see you're, you've seen this. It drops all its leaves. And you think that it's dead. It's actually not dead. It's not even necessarily a, a sign of major stress. It's a survival technique. The leaves are adapted to a certain climate. And it says, well, my leaves are no good in this climate. I need to change. And so it drops those leaves and grows out new ones. The new ones are adapted to the new climate. And that's how it survives. It's kind of like, you know, if, if it suddenly gets, uh, you know, maybe the morning started off really cold and I had my winter clothes on and then it warmed up more than I expected, I'm going to go change clothes, right? I'm going to go put on something more summer. I'm going to put on shorter sleeves. Uh, the ficus midgamina has the ability to do that. Yes? Taking that one step further with that, I mean that buying a younger, smaller plant first before uh, it grows out? Because it's going to lose the leaves and then... You know, um, the question is, uh, would it be beneficial to buy a smaller, younger plant first? Not necessarily, no. Um, fact is, whether you buy a small plant or a big plant, when you move it from one spot to another, it's going to happen. I've, I've known people who have come in and said, all I did was move the, the ficus tree from one end of the room to the other, <laughs> and it dropped all the leaves. Um, they're just... It's going to do it so one way or another. So smaller change in environment. Yeah, in some cases it is. And sometimes you don't even realize it. You know, maybe you've got a, a cooler on one end of the room, or maybe for some reason, maybe that side of the house is hotter because it's the side that faces the sun. You never even know what it is. And with ficus benjamina, I can't say that it's, it appears consistent to us. Sometimes people are able to take them home or move them around and not have a problem. And then other times, uh, it, there it goes. It's dropping its leaves. And it's so you, you never know when it's going to do it, but if it does it, don't panic. <laughs> it's going to be fine. Just don't panic. That's usually the, the big problem. People will throw these away thinking, oh, it's dead. It lost all its leaves. It's dead. Don't panic. Just leave it where it is. Don't move it. So even going from the store home? Yeah, going from the store home, it could happen. So, you know, what's your climate like at home compared to here at the store? You know, maybe it's similar, maybe it's not, um, or even just, uh, maybe it wasn't even here in the store for very long, it was, you know, at, at the growers before that. What's your climate like compared to the growers' climate? So, don't panic <laughs> and throw it away. Just leave it where it is and it'll be fine. Yes? What about lighting? What about lighting? This one uh, does prefer more highlight. 
yeah, you'll find it looks a lot better in, in, in good lighting. So how high does that one get in a pot? How high does that one get in a pot? As high as you will allow it. When it gets to the point where you don't want it to be in a higher, you start cutting. That is a full-size tree in California. They grow them outside and they are great big trees. So uh, you let it get to the size that you want. You trim it to keep it shorter. You trim it to have the shape that you want. Does it make any difference about the size of the pot? That Does it make any difference about the size of the pot? Um, yeah, there, I mean, it's going to need uh, some soil in it, but there comes a point where you just can't let it. If you're someone who has big rooms and high ceilings, there comes a point where you can only uh, allow the pot to get so big. Will it keep it smaller than keeping it in a small pot? Yeah, uh, actually keeping it in a smaller pot does help to dwarf it a little bit. Um, if there's a, a point where it is getting really root bound, yeah. it just would mean that you'd have to water it more often. Kind of like you would a bonsai. Bonsai live in much smaller pots than that and they survive. <laughs> so you can and fidget with that. Would you cut the roots back? The what? Would you cut the roots back and try to get smaller? Um, in some cases, I, I, I say you could, but I think in most cases it would be more, you're could just going to water it more often. Gets I, uh, not that I re uh, recall. This one is pretty good about going from, usually if there's a really sensitive tap root, yeah. it's something that you just wouldn't even repot at all because they, they don't like being transplanted. Okay. Yeah. So this one has no problem being transplanted. Yes? What's the age of that plant? What's the age of that plant? Uh, that one's probably a couple of years. Yeah. It's, um, if you've ever tried to grow a plant, uh, even if it's a fast growing plant, uh, Getting it to actually be full and pretty, it's one thing to get something tall or, you know, it could be a long spindly whip, but to actually make it full and pretty actually takes a little more time and attention. So, so that yeah. one can stay at almost as a shrub. As yeah, a if you tree. wanted to keep it that size for the rest of its life, by all means, go Just for it. Just prune it on top. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Let's see. Uh, something like this. Some of you might remember these. Um, they, we used to call these Wandering Jew, uh, and most people still know it as that name. They'll come in from time to time and ask, do you have Wandering Jew? Um, for those who prefer to be politically correct, there is a new name now. <laughs> uh, if you're having trouble finding Wandering Jew, try looking under Purple Inch Plant, because they have a tendency to kind of inch their way along. Uh, these are just, fun plants because they're, they're purple. If you've never seen one, um, they're purple and silver. It's actually got a glittery effect in the silver part of the leaf. If you get up close, they're really, really pretty. Fast growing. This is another one that I would say it's fast growing, uh, especially when it's got you know, real good light. It, it'll be nice and full, uh, but they have a tendency to wander and inch around and uh, get really leggy looking. So if you've got a plant like this, uh, plants that trail, and this one especially, but it, pretty much almost any plant that has a trailing effect, kind of need to be trimmed just once in a while because uh, they get leggy and stimmy looking. They just start looking kind of ugly. And uh, if you're growing your own, I would say you actually want to take those cuttings and put them back in the soil. It'll, it'll make it fuller. So someone actually had to put a lot of uh, a work into this. Even though it's a fast growing plant, they still had some time and, and effort uh, going into this. I've, I've grown these from cuttings before, and getting them to look actually full and nice like this uh, isn't quite as, uh, it's, it's easy, it just takes a while. So this one's actually got quite a bit of, okay, <laughs> quite a bit of age on it. So it's four or five years old? No? Um, it's probably still within the couple year range, but someone had to be working on it the whole time, <laughs> like a lot. It, it likes light, right? Um, yes, it does like light. It can tolerate probably medium light, but it will look its best in, in good light, in good light. Um, as far as good light goes, let's, let me uh, define that a little bit better. Um, in most cases, you want to go with indirect, but bright. 
Uh, so that means uh, maybe they're. Oh, I'm still kind of having trouble, isn't it? Um, indirect meaning, you can put in a window, maybe there's an awning or an eave, uh, there's a tree outside kind of filtering the light a little bit. Direct light is when you can actually see the disk of the sun so from where the plant is. That's direct light. If you can't see the disk but it's still pretty bright, that's indirect. Uh, some plants can, would be just fine, of course, with direct light. Uh, the ficus would probably be just fine. Uh, but some of them, we do have very, very intense light here. <laughs> And windows can get pretty hot if it's south facing or west facing. So sometimes you kind of want to back off on that. You want it bright, but bring it down to a more reasonable level. Okay. Um, I have to talk about orchids, because I know just about everyone has probably received an orchid as a gift, and now you're worried you're going to kill it, right? I get this all the time. Uh, the most common is the Phalaenopsis, that's the one with the big moth orchid. Um, we brought in something a little more unusual uh, this time. This is um, called the Noble uh, Dendrobium. You can call them nobles for short. Uh, the, the orchids, they're actually not as difficult to deal with as you might think. So usually you can come off the panic button <laughs> when someone gives you one. They're actually not that difficult. They are different from other houseplants, but they're not difficult. Uh, give them really good light. Uh, you can tell how good their, their lighting is by their green, actually. It should be a light green, almost, almost yellowish. Not quite, but almost. Should be very light green. If, if you notice the green getting darker, it means they're not getting quite as much light, uh, which actually, to a point, they can tolerate, as long as it's not too little. Because uh, if, if that happens, then you'll notice a, either wilting or failure to flower very well. So if you want good flowers, you want to have good lighting. So uh, the thing about uh, orchids is that most of them are epiphytes. In other words, they grow in trees. They don't grow in soil. They don't like having a lot of mushy soil stuff packed around there their roots, they, they like to have lots of air and freedom, lots of air. So they, they grow their, their uh, roots out looking for something to climb on. If you've ever had one of those phalaenopsis, those moth orchids, you notice the roots are always coming out the, the pod and, and growing kind of upward rather than going down into the soil. It's because they're looking for something to climb on. They climb on trees, that's how they grow. That's okay. Um, those roots will pull in uh, moisture from the air, so they do prefer humidity, but since here we don't have humidity, what you do is you put them into a pot full of usually something like bark, uh, chunky bark, and, and so you kind of have to gently pull those roots down and bury them in the bark, and then you take the whole pot and you soak it in water, and soak it for a good 20-30 minutes, and let that bark kind of absorb the water and then drain it out completely, and then over the about a week, no more. Uh, the, the bark will slowly, it'll have lots of air spaces in between the bark, because the bark is usually like that big, it's kind of chunky. And so there's lots of air spaces between the bark so that the, the roots, they have lots of air flow around them the way they like, and the bark is slowly releasing moisture into those air spaces, humidifying those roots. And so that's how they, they live in this climate, and they actually adapt pretty well if you're growing them that way. Now this particular one is more of a soil type. Only a fraction of orchids, there's many, many different kinds out there. Only a fraction of them actually like to grow in soil. This is one of them. And so, uh, again, you want a good, dra good draining soil. You'll, you'll notice it. The roots aren't nearly as thick as the moth orchid, but they're kind of on the thick side. And they're, they, they still like a good draining <coughs> soil. Um, give them some food. I'm gonna talk a little bit about fertilizer for just a sec. There's different types of fertilizer yeah, for house plants. The, the orchid? Mm -hmm. An orchid then should not be in a plastic. Plastic is fine in this climate, yeah. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can put it in a plastic pot. This actually has a insert actually okay. this is pretty common with these yeah um, so you can actually take uh, take the insert out 
Um, I would say if you get a, an orchid and it's in moss, please take the moss out. They have a tendency to rot in that moss. I think a lot of times the growers don't like to grow them in, um, uh, they don't like to pack them into the bark because as, as it's being trans, uh, transported to the store, you know, they're jostling around, the bark falls out, and it just turns into a mess, and so they tend to go with the easy street and use moss instead. It tends to stay too wet. If it came in moss, consider that a temporary packing material. Please take that out. Uh, put them into bark afterward. Again, this one, um, it, it doesn't apply to that because this is a terrestrial orchid. It, it grows in so, soil. So do you soak that one too? It, just yeah, like you would with a... Yeah, do you soak this one too? Just like you would with Soft one of the oil. other house plants, yeah. No, okay, mm -hmm. but if you're soaking it, it would work better in a terracotta plant uh, container than the plastic? Not necessarily. Maybe in some climates it would hurt. She was asking, um, would it work better in a terracotta rather than plastic? We're so arid. Things, uh, because of the lower level of humidity, soil aerates better. Somehow the air is just able to push through the, the soil better because it's so dry. Uh, so we don't have as many problems with, um, <laughs> with aeration in our soil as other climates have. It's something that uh, it will become a problem if you water too frequently because every time you water, the water is displacing the air in the soil. So that's why outside, especially, you always want to have a deep soaking rather than frequent soakings because it allows the soil to have plenty of water while still having air pass through it. So how often do you water an orchid like this? How often to water an orchid like this? Um, during the spring and summer, you're looking at about once a week. Probably most of the year you're going to be looking at once a week. In some cases, it might be a little bit more like five days or something, but this, right now it seems to be uh, pretty happy with the once a week. Okay. Is there any preference to bark? Is there any preference to bark? Usually it'll be labeled orchid bark. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's pretty cheap. You buy a bag of it for a few bucks and it's plenty to do several orchids with. So <clears throat> it's, a, it's generally uh, fur bark, I think. So some of them go in, in soil and some in bark? Yes, yeah, some go in. How do you know the difference? If the planters or nurseries are putting When you buy it, if it's in moss or bark, it's probably going to bark. be bark. Mm -hmm. If it's in soil, um, or sometimes it'll be not quite soil, not quite bark, it's sort of a chunky yeah. in between, you know, uh, you know, generally that means okay, that's fine. The easiest way to tell, I found, is that the epiphytes tend to have a much thicker root. If you look at those moth orchids, again, that's the one that's really, really common. They've got this quarter inch thick root. It's a thick, thick root. That's an epiphyte. The ones that are more terrestrial tend to have much thinner roots. If you look at these, they're more like uh, maybe a sixteenth um, of an inch, maybe a tad bit thicker. They're, they're much, uh, the epiphytes, the ones that grow in the air, just have a much bigger root. Does that one have a fragrance? Um, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I actually don't have a good nose. I don't smell anything, but maybe you would. I, I don't have a very good nose. Um, but that one. Uh, and then uh, for fertilizer, they do make fertilizers for orchids, like this one here. This is a fertilizer for orchids, 756. I actually find you can get away with any kind of uh, houseplant fertilizer that's for flowering houseplants. So, you know, if, if orchid mix isn't available, you can go with, uh, this one is for African violets and, and for all flowering houseplants. This will work. Um, the one I was just holding, I think, has a good amount of, this one that I dropped. Uh, this one has micronutrients in it. So it's a, a, a good, complete fertilizer. I don't like having a, seven different fertilizers for all these different plants. I think you should have one that works well. If you've got a really good fertilizer, it will work well for multiple types of plants. Don't let the labels fool you. Just because it says for well, orchids doesn't mean you can't put this on your African violets. So go ahead and you know have one that you're happy with and use it for, for everything. All right. 
So uh, I touched a little bit on, on uh, fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer is going to be important for keeping flowers blooming. There's always three numbers on a fertilizer. Those are the macronutrients. And they're just sort of like our, our diet has macronutrients, has proteins and carbs. Um, same thing with them, they have macronutrients. So this is uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Nitrogen is for your green leafy growth. Phosphorus is the middle number, that's for blooming and rooting. So that, uh, if you've got anything that's supposed to flower, it, you're gonna need to fertilize. If, if you don't fertilize, you'll notice nothing ever blooms, or very rarely. Uh, and then the last one is potash, that is for strength, uh, good strong stems, um, high immunity, um, things like that. A lot of you have come in and asked for Schultz. This is kind of the classic right here. <laughs> uh, Schultz it has been a long time name in houseplant fertilizers. And then they shut down. They, someone made them an offer and wanted to buy their factories. They didn't actually want their product, they just wanted their factories. They bought Schultz's factories and stopped making the product. And so everyone was coming in, where's our Schultz, where's our Schultz? Well, somebody realized, hey, this was a good product that people liked. So they, somebody has uh, bought the recipe or something and started making Schultz again. So for those of you that were looking for it, here it is, <laughs> it's back. Okay, let's, uh, how about temperature? Temperature. Most plants want to have a, the same kind of temperature that you would be comfortable in. That's the best way to put it. Uh, most of these are tropicals. They don't come from places that ever get cold. Um, but at the same time, they're not used to hot and arid either. A lot of times though, they do like to go outside during the summertime, uh, you know, when it's not too cold to be out. Just put them in, in the shady spot, put them on the porch, uh, put them under the trees. A lot of people find that it's very beneficial for their plants. I, I sometimes do it even here because uh, uh, they've been cooped up in the house all winter in a relatively dim area. You can put them outside for the summer as soon as it's warm enough to, for them to survive out there. Uh, you can go ahead and put them, in, uh, put them on the porch, hang them under a tree, something like that, and they're pretty happy and they, they really boost up during that time. They'll put on a lot of growth, their stems will strengthen. They love it, actually. They really do. There's an area in the kitchen that is probably the sunniest. Mm -hmm. but it's on a granite buildup. Okay. So it's two windows and it's beautiful and it's sunny, but it seems like that granite is cold. So okay. It's sitting on the, the counter itself. Okay. If, if you're worried that the granite is too cold, that's a pretty simple fix actually. Just put some kind of mat under the pot and that will take care of it. So, but if it seems like it's a pretty sunny window and it's otherwise warm other than the way the granite feels, she was saying that uh, she's got some sunny, su sunny windows and uh, for the most part seem kind of warm, but the granite seems to take, stay cold for a really long time. Uh, she was worried about putting the plant on, on that cold granite. You could just put a mat under it and that would take care of it. Uh, it you know, think about how uh, cold the air is getting there at night would be the only thing I'd say, you know, what is the temperature? And this can kind of vary from for most plants, but generally they're they're fine as they can go. Uh, they're most comfortable in, in around 70, 60, 70, but the, most of them can actually go down to 50 as long as it's, you know, just for a night, for a short time, that's fine. They can do that. Um, the ones that tend to be the most sensitive, I've got one here. This is aloe vera. You'll notice if they, if they get too cold, and this especially happens in windows, it, if you have them in a windowsill or just really close to a window, and it's not a good insulated window, you know, the newer houses all have double panes, the older houses don't, you'll notice that the leaves start turning red. So you'll know something's going on. Even with some of the other plants, you'll see, you know, wilting or some sign of stress. They won't just die the first night. Don't worry, that's not going to happen. If they're too cold, they're not going to just die on you and not give you another chance they'll show a, a symptom that something is going on. It might be discoloration, it might be a wilting or something like that. Uh, sometimes it'll, it'll look kind of similar to overwatering. Just pull the plant back further from the window. Since I've got a succulent in my hand, 
Um, the most common problem with these uh, is trying to figure out when to water. Uh, some people will say, well, water when the soil is completely dried out. That actually doesn't work too well with succulents. Sometimes the soil is completely dried out and they still don't want water. And if you give them water, they're going to complain. So how do you figure out when a succulent needs water? Well, in the case of succulents like this, it's actually pretty simple. Just uh, feel the leaves. If it feels firm, don't water. When they, as they uh, start depleting their uh, water reserves, because they store water in their leaves as well as their stems, when those uh, uh, reserves start depleting, you'll notice it gets softer. Little by little, it gets softer and softer. So if it's fairly soft, it's okay if it's, it's just a tad, it doesn't have to be rock hard. But if it's firm, don't water. But if it's feeling uh, rather soft, go ahead and water. It's time to do it now. Um, give them plenty of light. All of them like light. They love plenty of light. That's one of those that uh, sometimes during the summer it's good to put them outside <laughs> in a filtered light area, if, especially if, uh, if they seem to be, if the leaves are kind of laying down, especially like on an aloe, they're really good about telling you this. If the leaves are kind of laying down, it means that it could use some more light. Put it out for the summer. If you're having trouble finding a sunny enough window indoors, um, you know, bring them inside for the winter, but give them some relief from that by putting them outdoors in a filtered light area for the summer. Um, put them in a place, you don't want to, with the, in the case of the aloe vera, they don't like going from one extreme to another. They, they want to be gradually adapted. You can put these in full sun, but they need to be, it needs to be done gradually. So put them on the porch at first or under a tree, something like that, where they don't get direct sunlight and, and slowly work them out to being out there. Usually in direct sunlight, in our case, is pretty good though. If you're going to fertilize a, a, a cactus, um, they don't want nearly as much nitrogen as other house plants. So you'll notice that cactus fertilizers have a, that first lower, first number is much lower. This one's a 277. So most of the fertilizers have something like 5, 10, 15. This one's only a 2. That's why. Would yes. a Christmas cactus fall into the same category as an aloe? Would a Christmas cactus fall into the same category as an aloe? Yeah. Uh, pretty much. Uh, it is a tropical cactus, mm -hmm. so um, you can again use the same method. You, know, you can kind of squeeze the leaves in most cases until, you know. Um, but with that one, you can go ahead and just let the soil dry out and then give them water in most cases. Let it really dry out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's actually. In, in its native habitat, it is an epiphyte, again, grows on trees and logs. Um, so it's something that uh, likes a good draining soil because it wants plenty of good aeration. In a small pot, you can actually put them in regular potting soil. Normally you would put cactuses, a cactus and succulents into uh, a cactus mix because it's a, a chunkier mix that has really good drainage, doesn't stay too wet, has really good aeration, with the Christmas cactus, you can actually go to potting soil unless it's a big pot. And I say it might be beneficial to go into a cactus mix. So it likes a small pot? Yeah, all of them do. The, all the house plants, um, I don't think I can think of any exceptions to the rule. Ferns can go a little bit bigger than some of the others, but there's still a limit. Okay. Yeah, don't, don't go too big on your house plant pots. And that includes your succulents and your cactus. They don't have big root systems anyway. So that, that would just be a lot of soil staying wet. Yeah, keep your pots tight. Any other questions? Okay, let's see. Let's see, I've got a, a, a number of plants up here and uh, I've got some, some products and I've also got more plants over there. Um, let's talk quickly about pest control and then I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll go over to the house plant room and you guys can just ask whatever you like about uh, house plants and their care and so on. Let's see. Uh, so pest control, they actually are just as prone to getting pests as the outside plants almost. So it's good to know a few things about what to do when you're having issues with that. Let's see. I thought, oh, I thought I had something else up here. So generally with the house plants, um, most, uh, a lot of the pesticides you use for the outdoor house plant, uh, outdoor plants can also be used for uh, house plants as well. Things like well, we carry a few things here, uh, neem oil, uh, Captain Jack's, 
um, the uh, multi-purpose insect control, all of those can be used on, on house plants. Uh, this one I've got up here, uh, this is horticultural and dormant oil. This one actually works really well uh, for uh, things like uh, palms, dracaenas, um, just about anything really. These are really nice for spider mites. I find that spider mites are really, really hard to get rid of. This one seems to knock them back better than most things that I've tried. Um, the multi-purpose insect control is another one that's really good for the, actually any of those can work on spider mites, but I do find those are especially hard and to get rid of and house plants do get spider mites. So uh, this can be used indoors and outdoors. All of these can. You spray that or pour that? Um, this is something that you would mix with water and spray on. Yeah. And then if you have, I'm sorry, I thought I had all the pesticides up here. Another one that's really common is the fungus gnats. Um, can I have some systemic granules, please? Thank you. Um, fungus gnats, yes. Uh, I'm not familiar with spider mites. Spider okay. mites? Yeah. Okay. Spider mites are, um, they're mites. They're super tiny, the size of a grain of dust. And most of the time you can't really see the mites themselves. Most people can't. I can, usually. I have really good nearsighted eyes, <laughs> but um, they are super, super tiny. So mostly you see symptoms rather than the mites themselves. The plant will look dusty, and uh, after a while, uh, during certain times of the year, you'll see webs forming, but not webs like a spider web. It, I mean, it, it'll be a really fine mesh web. It'll be down in the, the crooks of the plant. You know, it'll be down here. It won't be one long web stretch like this in most cases. So they, they're pretty much close to the soil. Yeah, it'll be not close to the soil, but close to the little, the little crooks of the stems. You know, it'll be more in here. You know, because they're so tiny that they only need a little bit of space to stretch their web across. I, I think only a couple of times I've seen a web actually stretch across a long distance because they're so tiny. So you'll see a, a very fine mesh of, of webbing in the, in the little crooks of the plant, and it'll look dusty, and the leaves will look dusty, and you'll sometimes even see a speckling effect, like the plant itself is getting a kind of little uh, light-colored speckles. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of nasty to deal with for being so small, actually. But so the, the white dusting that kind of it's almost like a moldy not it's not mold it's a kind of like little itty bitty bits of white, white cloth all over um <clears throat> if you're talking about mealy bug uh it's possible that you're talking about or is it more of a film almost a, a film of dust yeah it's more like these little clumps white yeah, that sounds like mealy bug. Okay. She's seeing a little tiny clumps of white fluff, right? Or white little things right. just kind of dotted around. Yeah. That's mealy bug, and they specialize in house plants. <laughs> so that's something. Um, use something that works well on aphids for that. Uh, they're very similar to aphids. So um, you want to use like the multi purpose insect control. Uh, you can use the dormant oil. Um, the neem oil would work. Ladybugs, except I don't think you bring ladybugs in the house. <laughs> uh, so things like that, yeah. Mealybugs, they do get in uh, into plants outdoors, but it's rare. They're, it's more house plants that tends to get them. So I had the, the neem oil. What, what, what the neem oil? oil? Neem oil. Yeah. And uh, how often? I mean, once a week until it's gone, constantly? Um, yeah, go ahead and try once a week. You can also use the systemic granules. And this, uh, this comes down to whether you prefer organic or not. Um, if, so if you're using the neem oil, look at the directions and see how, how often, uh, it, this goes for any spray, how often and how, long, how many applications are you allowed to do. Even with organic products, it'll give you uh, a certain number that you're allowed to do, then you have to stop and get the plant to rest. Um, but yeah, probably about once a week. Should you try to get under the leaves as well, or just spray yes? Them? And can you spray also, them in the house or take them out and spray? You can spray in the house. Neem oil is perfectly safe around kids, pets, whatever. I mean, you can actually eat the stuff. They, they actually sell supplements with neem. It, yeah, they brush their teeth with it, and they 
I use it as an insect repellent on their skin. It's that, that's why it's really safe. So yeah, you, you, can, you can spray it in the house, but it's kind of smelly if you want to, you can take it outside. <laughs> Another thing with the muley bug is um, make sure you wash down the pot and nearby surfaces because they like to find a hard surface to lay their eggs on. And those eggs will also look like little white bits of fluff. <laughs> but uh, they're so tiny sometimes and you don't always notice them. So just really wipe down all the surfaces uh, around the plant. Uh, systemic granules, um, this one's rather popular, not organic, so don't use this one on your indoor herb garden. Don't put this on anything you're gonna eat. Don't put this on your citrus trees. You can't put it on, on like your indoor Meyer lemon. Uh, but um, this is just so easy to use and effective, so a lot of people really love this stuff. If you've got little black gnats flying around the house, this is the quickest way to deal with those. You just sprinkle this on the soil, and it'll take care of um, all the larvae that are living in the soil. They're really, really common here, and they're really annoying. This is pretty easy to take care of. You can also use diatomaceous earth, but you've got to scratch that into the soil. So either of those will work for fungus gnats. Also this, because it's systemic, meaning the plant will absorb it. That's why you can't use it on your herbs. The plant will absorb it. So if you're getting tired of dealing with sprays or if the plant is just really hard to spray for some reason, this is another way you can go. It doesn't work on spider mites because they're not insects, but it will work on insects. Mealybugs are insects, aphids, um, you know, whatever kind of insect is on your plant, you can put this on the soil, water it in, and the plant will absorb it and actually become toxic. Um, it's something that, uh, uh, especially if you're kind of nature-minded, you want to think of twice about using it outside on flowers because then bees would get to it and things like that. But indoors, you don't have to worry about bees, butterflies, hummingbirds. So um, this is something that most people are pretty uh, comfortable with using on non-edibles in the house. Um, it's not necessarily going to kill a pet or anything, but to an insect, it's you know pretty pretty da dangerous. So that uh, that kind of covers uh, an overview of the, the pesticides.